Story seven of the House with the Mezzanine and Other Stories by Anton Chekhov. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story seven My Life The Story of a Provincial Part seven came the rainy, muddy, dark autumn, bringing a slack time, and I used to sit at home three days in the week without work, or did various jobs outside painting, such as digging earth for ballast for twenty kopecks a day. Dr. Blagovo had gone to Petersburg. My sister did not come to see me. Radish lay at home ill, expecting to die every day. And my mood was also autumnal. Perhaps because when I became a working man I saw only the seamy side of the life of our town, and every day made fresh discoveries which brought me to despair. My fellow townsmen, both those of whom I had had a low opinion before, and those whom I had thought fairly decent, now seemed to me base, cruel, and up to any dirty trick. We poor people were tricked and cheated in the accounts kept waiting for hours in cold passages or in the kitchen, and we were insulted and uncivilly treated. In the autumn I had to paper the library and two rooms at the club. I was paid seven kopecks apiece, but was told to give a receipt for twelve kopecks, and when I refused to do it, a respectable gentleman in gold spectacles, one of the stewards of the club, said to me, if you say another word, you scoundrel, I'll knock you down. And when a servant whispered to him that I was the son of Poloniev, the architect, then I got flustered and blushed, but he recovered himself at once and said, Damn him! In the shops we working men were sold bad meat, musty flour, and coarse tea. In church we were jostled by the police, and in the hospitals we were mulcted by the assistants and nurses, and if we could not give them bribes through poverty, we were given food in dirty dishes. In the post office the lowest official considered it his duty to treat us as animals, and to shout rudely and insolently, "'Wait! Don't you come pushing your way in here!' Even the dogs— even they were hostile to us, and hurled themselves at us with a peculiar malignancy. But what struck me most of all in my new position was the entire lack of justice, what the people call forgetting God. Rarely a day went by without some swindle. The shopkeeper who sold us oil, the contractor, the workmen, the customers themselves, all cheated. It was an understood thing that our rights were never considered, and we always had to pay for the money we had earned, going with our hats off to the back door. I was paper-hanging in one of the club rooms, next to the library, when, one evening as I was on the point of leaving, Dolikov's daughter came into the room carrying a bundle of books. I bowed to her. "'Ah, how are you?' she said, recognizing me at once and holding out her hand. I'm very glad to see you." She smiled and looked with a curious, puzzled expression at my blouse and the pail of paste and the papers lying on the floor. I was embarrassed, and she also felt awkward. "'Excuse my staring at you,' she said. I have heard so much about you, especially from Dr. Blagovo. He is enthusiastic about you. I have met your sister. She is a dear, sympathetic girl, but I could not make her see that there is nothing awful in your simple life. On the contrary, you are the most interesting man in town." Once more she glanced at the pail of paste and the paper, and said, "'I asked Dr. Blagovo to bring us together, but he either forgot or had no time. However, we have met now. I should be very pleased if you would call on me. I do so want to have a talk. I am a simple person," she said, holding out her hand, and I hope you will come and see me without ceremony. My father is away in Petersburg. She went into the reading-room with her dress rustling, and for a long time after I got home I could not sleep. During that autumn some kind soul, wishing to relieve my existence, sent me from time to time presents of tea and lemons, or biscuits, or roast pigeons. Karpovna said the presents were brought by a soldier, though from whom she did not know. 
and the soldier used to ask if I was well, if I had dinner every day, and if I had warm clothes. When the frost began, the soldier came while I was out and brought a soft knitted scarf, which gave out a soft, hardly perceptible scent, and I guessed who my good fairy had been. For the scarf smelled of lily of the valley, and Uita Blagovo's favorite scent. Toward winter there was more work, and things became more cheerful. Radish came to life again, and we worked together in the cemetery church, where we scraped the holy shrine for gilding. It was a clean, quiet, and, as our mates said, a specially good job. We could do a great deal in one day, and so time passed quickly, imperceptibly. There was no swearing, nor laughing, nor loud altercations. The place compelled quiet and decency, and disposed one for tranquil, serious thoughts. Absorbed in our work, we stood or sat immovably, like statues. There was a dead silence, very proper to a cemetery, so that if a tool fell down, or the oil in the lamp sputtered, the sound would be loud and startling, and we would turn to see what it was. After a long silence, one could hear a humming like that of a swarm of bees. In the porch, in an undertone, the funeral service was being read over a dead baby, or a painter painting a moon surrounded with stars on the cupola would begin to whistle quietly, and remembering suddenly that he was in church, would stop, or Radish would sigh at his own thoughts. Anything may happen, anything may happen or above our heads there would be a slow, mournful tolling of a bell, and the painters would say it must be a rich man being brought to the church. The days I spent in the peace of the little church, and during the evenings I played billiards, or went to the gallery of the theatre in the new serge suit I had bought with my own hard-earned money. They were already beginning plays and concerts at the Azekins, and Radish did the scenery by himself. He told me about the plays and tableau vivant at the Azequins, and I listened to him enviously. I had a great longing to take part in the rehearsals, but I dared not go to the Azequins. A week before Christmas Dr. Blagovo arrived, and we resumed our arguments and played billiards in the evenings. When we played billiards, he used to take off his coat and unfasten his shirt at the neck, and generally try to look like a debauchee. He drank a little, but rowdily, and managed to spend in a cheap tavern like the Volga as much as twenty roubles in an evening. Once more my sister came to see me, and when they met they expressed surprise, but I could see by her happy, guilty face that these meetings were not accidental. One evening, when we were playing billiards, the doctor said to me, "'I say, why don't you call on Miss Dolikoff? You don't know Maria Viktorovna. She is a clever, charming, simple creature.' I told him how the engineer had received me in the spring. "'Nonsense!' laughed the doctor. "'The engineer is one thing, and she is another. Really, my good fellow, you mustn't offend her. Go and see her some time.' Let us go to-morrow evening, will you?" He persuaded me. Next evening I donned my serge suit, and with some perturbation set out to call on Miss Dolikoff. The footman did not seem to me so haughty and formidable, or the furniture so oppressive, as on the morning when I had come to ask for work. Maria Viktorovna was expecting me, and greeted me as an old friend, and gave my hand a warm, friendly grip. She was wearing a grey dress with wide sleeves, and had her hair done in the style which, when it became the fashion a year later in our town, was called dog's ears. The hair was combed back over the ears, and it made Maria Viktorovna's face look broader, and she looked very like her father, whose face was broad and red, and rather like a coachman's. She was handsome and elegant, but not young about thirty to judge by her appearance, though she was not more than twenty-five. "'Dear doctor,' she said, making me sit down, "'how grateful I am to him! But for him you would not have come. I am bored to death. My father has gone and left me alone, and I do not know what to do with myself.' 
Then she began to ask where I was working, how much I got, and where I lived. "'Do you only spend what you earn on yourself?' she asked. "'Yes.' "'You are a happy man,' she replied. "'All the evil in life, it seems to me, comes from boredom and idleness and spiritual emptiness, which are inevitable when one lives at other people's expense. Don't think I'm showing off. I mean it sincerely. It is dull and unpleasant to be rich. Win friends by just riches, they say, because as a rule there is and can be no such thing as just riches.' She looked at the furniture with a serious, cold expression, as though she was making an inventory of it, and went on. Ease and comfort possess a magic power. Little by little they seduce even strong-willed people. Father and I used to live poorly and simply, and now you see how we live. Isn't it strange? she said with a shrug. We spend twenty thousand roubles a year. In the provinces! Ease and comfort must not be regarded as the inevitable privilege of capital and education, I said. It seems to me possible to unite the comforts of life with work, however hard and dirty it may be. Your father is rich, but as he says, he used to be a mechanic, and just a lubricator. She smiled and shook her head thoughtfully. Papa sometimes eats tirunya, she said, but only out of caprice. A bell rang, and she got up. The rich and the educated ought to work like the rest, she went on, and if there is to be any comfort, it should be accessible to all. There should be no privileges. However, that's enough philosophy. Tell me something cheerful. Tell me about the painters. What are they like? Funny? The doctor came. I began to talk about the painters, but being unused to it, I felt awkward and talked solemnly and ponderously, like an ethnographist. The doctor also told a few stories about working people. He rocked to and fro and cried and fell on his knees, and when he was depicting a drunkard, lay flat on the floor. It was as good as a play, and Maria Viktorovna laughed until she cried. Then he played the piano and sang in his high-pitched tenor, and Maria Viktorovna stood by him and told him what to sing, and corrected him when he made a mistake. "'I hear you sing, too,' said I. "'Too,' cried the doctor. "'She is a wonderful singer, an artist. And you say, too. Careful, careful.' "'I used to study seriously,' she replied, "'but I have given it up now.' She sat on a low stool and told us about her life in Petersburg, and imitated famous singers, mimicking their voices and mannerisms. Then she sketched the doctor and myself in her album, not very well, but both were good likenesses. She laughed and made jokes and funny faces, and this suited her better than talking about unjust riches, and it seemed to me that what she had said about riches and comfort came not from herself, but was just mimicry. She was an admirable comedian. I compared her mentally with the girls of our town, and not even the beautiful, serious Anuita Blagovo could stand up against her. The difference was as vast as that between a wild and a garden rose. We stayed to supper. The doctor and Maria Viktorovna drank red wine, champagne, and coffee with cognac. They touched glasses and drank to friendship, to wit, to progress, to freedom, and never got drunk, but went rather red and laughed for no reason until they cried. To avoid being out of it, I, too, drank red wine. "'People with talent and with gifted natures,' said Miss Dolikoff, "'know how to live and go their own way, but ordinary people like myself know nothing and can do nothing by themselves. There is nothing for them but to find some deep social current and let themselves be borne along by it. "'Is it possible to find that which does not exist?' asked the doctor." It doesn't exist because we don't see it. Is that so? Social currents are the invention of modern literature. They don't exist here. A discussion began. We have no profound social movements, nor have we had them, said the doctor. 
Modern literature has invented a lot of things, and modern literature invented intellectual working men in village life, but go through all our villages and you will only find Mr. Cheeky Snout in a jacket or a black frock coat who will make four mistakes in the word one. Civilized life has not begun with us yet. We have the same savagery, the same slavery, the same nullity as we had five hundred years ago. Movements, currents, all that is so wretched and puerile, mixed up with such vulgar catchpenny interests, and one cannot take it seriously. You may think you have discovered a large social movement, and you may follow it and devote your life in the modern fashion to such problems as the liberation of vermin from slavery or the abolition of meat cutlets, and I congratulate you, madam. But we have had to learn, 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 and there will be plenty of time for social movements. We are not up to them yet, and upon my soul we don't understand anything at all about them. You don't understand, but I do, said Maria Viktorovna. Good heavens, what a bore you are tonight! It is our business to learn and learn, to try and accumulate as much knowledge as possible, because serious social movements come where there is knowledge, and the future happiness of mankind lies in science. Here's to science! One thing is certain. Life must somehow be arranged differently, said Maria Viktorovna, after some silence and deep thought, and life as it has been up to now is worthless. Don't let us talk about it. When we left her, the cathedral clock struck two. Did you like her? asked the doctor. Isn't she a dear girl? We had dinner at Maria Viktorovna's on Christmas Day, and then we went to see her every day during the holidays. There was nobody besides ourselves, and she was right when she said she had no friends in the town but the doctor and me. We spent most of the time talking, and sometimes the doctor would bring a book or a magazine and read aloud. After all, he was the first cultivated man I had met. I could not tell if he knew much, but he was always generous with his knowledge, because he wished others to know, too. When he talked about medicine, he was not like any of our local doctors, but he made a new and singular impression, and it seemed to me that if he had wished, he could have become a genuine scientist. And perhaps he was the only person at that time who had any real influence over me. Meeting him and reading the books he gave me, I began gradually to feel a need for knowledge to inspire the tedium of my work. It seemed strange to me that I had not known before such things as that the whole world consisted of sixty elements. I did not know what oil or paint was, and I could do without knowing. My acquaintance with the doctor raised me morally, too. I used to argue with him, and though I usually stuck to my opinions, yet through him I came gradually to perceive that everything was not clear to me, and I tried to cultivate convictions as definite as possible, so that the promptings of my conscience should be precise and have nothing vague about them. Nevertheless, educated and fine as he was, far and away the best man in the town, he was by no means perfect. There was something rather rude and priggish in his ways, and in his trick of dragging talk down to discussion, and when he took off his coat and sat in his shirt, and gave the footman a tip, it always seemed to me that culture was just a part of him, with the rest untamed tartar. After the holidays he left once more for Petersburg. He went in the morning, and after dinner my sister came to see me. Without taking off her furs she sat silent, very pale, staring in front of her. She began to shiver, and seemed to be fighting against some illness. "'You must have caught a cold,' I said. Her eyes filled with tears. She rose and went to Karpovna without a word to me, as though I had offended her, and a little later I heard her speaking in a tone of bitter reproach. "'Nurse, what have I been living for up to now? What for? Tell me, haven't I wasted my youth? During the last years I have had nothing but making up accounts, pouring out tea, 
counting the copecks, entertaining guests, without a thought that there was anything better in the world. Nurse, try to understand me. I, too, have human desires, and I want to live, and they have made a housekeeper of me. It is awful, awful. She flung her keys against the door, and they fell with a clatter in my room. They were the keys of the sideboard, the larder, the cellar, and the tea-chest, the keys my mother used to carry. "'Oh, oh, saints above!' cried my old nurse in terror. "'The blessed saints!' When she left, my sister came into my room for her keys and said, "'Forgive me. Something strange has been going on in me lately.' End of Part 7